of a tradition of inviting uh, non-lawyers to shed uh, an, an alternative disciplinary light on some of the issues that are key to us as lawyers. And it also helps to set up the discussions on the panel that comes after lunch on uh, gender in sport. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sylvia uh, Camparese of the University of Vienna and of King's College London to speak for to us uh, this afternoon. Sylvia is a bioethicist um, and a double PhD holder, uh, which is, I always think is quite awesome to begin with. Her first PhD was in the foundations of life sciences and ethics, and the second in the philosophy of medicine. So she's ideally placed to be talking on the subject today of the transnational regulation of gender by international sports bodies. Um, she'll be speaking on this as, as a, one of her specific areas of expertise, uh, in particular on sports medicine and ethics. And it's obviously bringing to uh, a conclusion some of the issues that we've seen in the Casta Semenya case of which uh, Sylvia has, has written on, on a number of occasions. These key cases, as we've seen uh, in this morning's sessions and from Stephen's uh, keynote yesterday, We've got, we're in the process of a number of major decisions coming out. The, the competition issues we've looked at have been in respect to the European Court of Justice and the Custis Amendment decision, obviously, on the European Court of Human Rights. Decisions that are likely to impact on the regulation of sport for a very long time, regardless, really, of what the outcome will be. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sylvia and uh, welcome her to give the speech this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Mark and Antoine, for inviting me to the conference here. I'm delighted to be here. And um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's the first time I attend this conference, but uh, I found it really interesting and fascinating. I think there are a lot of intersection between uh, um, my research interest uh, in ethics uh, in, and sport and law. So I hope there will be more of this intersection. As, as Mark was saying, I'm an ethicist. I come from a biotechnology background, and then I retrained uh, in a philosophy of medicine and ethics. And I've been working on ethics of sport um, uh, now for over 15 years. So I come to the cases of um, Caster Semena, athletes with DSD, and uh, trans athletes eligibility from uh, my expertise in uh, ethics and philosophy of sport and in biology. I'm not a gender studies person. But uh, over the years, uh, I would never have thought that I would still be talking about these cases, uh, you know, um, when I started writing about them in 2009. But here we go, here we are, we're still <laughs> talking about these cases and actually their legacy is uh, only increasing. So. Uh, what I wanted to say is that um, um, in my paper today, I'm going to talk about uh, values, norms, and evidence uh, regarding eligibility criteria to compete in the female category. It's a, it's a broad talk, which I start uh, from the shared premise, uh, which pertains to both uh, DSD athletes and uh, trans athletes, which is the presumption of unfair advantage, which is relevant for both cases. And then I discuss the issue of unfair advantage, what kinds of unfair advantage, by whom, what kind of evidence goes into this discussion. I've, I'm gonna talk about the court of arbitration for sport, of course, and um, over the years, uh, what I've written alone or with co-authors such as Jonathan Ospina, Betancourt, and uh, Simon Franklin and the London School of Economics has been used in part by, for example, in 2018, we were asked to, to write a report which was submitted as preliminary evidence by the Norton Rose and Fulbright a CAS. But then, as I'm also going to discuss, the kind of evidence which uh, CAS considered to be uh, the important evidence is the scientific evidence. Um, so there is a hierarchy of um, evidence or expertise and um, ethics um, is not uh, up there. 
but that might be, as I argue, something that we should uh, like reconsider when we discuss issue of unfair advantage. So starting from that, discussing then evidence, when is uh, evidence considered enough and criteria for admissibility of evidence. And then I'll discuss uh, what I uh, build in on um, uh, others' work uh, uh, I consider a pragmatic approach to policy making uh, in this area based on a compass uh, of uh, values and conclude with some procedural fairness recommendation and what um, I think is important. So as you can see, I have no slides. <laughs> I'm just gonna talk and uh, leave, um, I'm gonna talk for about um, 35, uh, 40 minutes, then it should be Plenty of time for questions before lunch. So I'm gonna start about uh, to discuss the implicit understandings of fairness that are at play when we discuss eligibility criteria to compete in the female category. I'm gonna start from the CAS rule in 2018 on the Semenya case, which stated um, with two arbitrators out of three, that the differences of sex differentiation regulation, which were introduced in 2018, are appropriate measures to level the playing field, which, according to World Athletics, is disrupted in a relevant way by endogenous elevated level of testosterone. And again, the difference of sex differentiation regulation are an appropriate measure to reach that legitimate objective of the figuration, which is to regulate competition and restore 11 playing field. The CAS ruling in 2019 never explicitly engaged with the question of fairness, meaning never discussed what do we mean by fairness. It gave it for granted. I mean, the entire case of Castro Semenya has been couched in language of fairness from the Federation from the start, going back to 2011, when the hyperandrogenism regulation were introduced. They were introduced uh, in the language of fairness. Uh, Sebastian Co has talked about fairness and the need to protect the female categories. We've heard from other athletes, uh, including the Italian Elisa Kuzma in 2009, when the Castro Semenya case first broke at the World Athletics Championship in Berlin, saying that uh, it's unfair to compete um, against them. So the, it is without doubt that we're talking about fairness, but just what is that we're talking about? And the CAS ruling never explicitly engaged with the question, although in comma 474 of the award, the, judge, the arbitrators sum, sum up the, what they call factual and scientific question that the panel had to deal with and refer to the magnitude of the advantage given by elevated level of endogenous serum testosterone as being a key question for the judgment of fairness in the case. Now, as I've argued uh, in my articles, which are published mostly in uh, like ethics and philosophy of sports journal, but also in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2018, although empirical data referring to the magnitude of the advantage can help us answer the question of the extent to which the advantage conferred by testosterone is quantitatively different from the advantage given by other genetic and biological variation, by themselves, these empirical data as pertaining to the magnitude of the advantage provided by testosterone fall short of establishing whether this advantage can be considered unfair. They're only telling us how great this advantage is. Without having an empirical analysis as I argue of, uh, which is comparative, so as the relative degree of the advantage compared to other biological and genetic advantages, this analysis cannot tell us whether this advantage is unfair. Unfortunately, as we know, and no better than me, the CASA award decided that all the testimony and witness, expert witness brought um, to the court, for example, Alun um, Williams of Manchester Metropolitan University saying, hey guys, and uh, you've seen there are all these other 
biological uh, allelic variations that also provide an advantage. The only difference between the two is that uh, uh, we um, there are uh, we know much more about testosterone compared to other advantages, but the magnitude is the same. But Cass decided that it was not relevant for the discussion because had been asked only to assess whether there was enough evidence in support of the regulation. <clears throat> okay, so this is the first understanding of uh, fairness uh, of world athletics. Uh, of the federation, there was a disruption to the level playing field, which we need to redress through pharmacological intervention. Instead, the arguments put forward by Semenya and Chand before her in 2015, and their lawyers speak to a different implicit understanding of fairness. They speak to the distinction between endogenous or natural advantage due to Chand famously said, I want to compete with the body I was born with. They speak to the distinction between endogenous or natural advantage and an exogenous uh, uh, advantage provided by uh, performance um, uh, enhancing drugs. So they say, my body has not been tampered with. This is a natural advantage and it is fair that I compete with my own body without external intervention. So their implicit uh, fairness, um, their implicit understanding of fairness entails being able to compete with one's own untempered body, as long as the levels are natural. And this is not unfair to fellow competitors. With, I'm sorry for Elisa Kuzma, the Italian. Uh, I should have said earlier, I, I come from athletics. Yes, so I used to be not very successful, middle distance runner. So I know at least <laughs> what it means to run those two laps, but I was competing against, I remember Elisa Kuzma, she was you know, one of the top Italian 800 meters runners. She's my age. Uh, but there were other comments along similar lines, Lindsay Sharp. Uh, so, our understanding of fairness is unfair to compete against them, while for duty chand or Casa Semena, it's not unfair to compete against us. It's just the way it is. It's part of the game. Think of Simon Biles, or Usain Bolt, or Michael Phelps at the top of their career, or even Duplantis. Now I like to talk about the Swedish. Yeah, what do you think about Duplantis? I mean, it's another planet. So I'm sorry for the other, uh, including the, the Italian uh, uh, pole vault jumper, but it's just the way it is. They have to compete against somebody who's just exceptional outside of the curve. We'll go back to those outliers later. Okay, um, so in the most, I'm gonna now uh, try to unpack a little more and the meaning of uh, unfair advantage, uh, looking at the 2021 IOC framework on um, inclusion, where they have uh, a definition of uh, unfair and disproportionate competitive advantage as an advantage gained by altering one's body, so the cheating, uh, the doping, uh, you know, the advantage gained by altering one body, or one that disproportionately exceeds other advantages that exceed at high level competition. So there is a shift here from an attempt to define unfairness in sport uh, to an attempt at defining fair and unfair advantage in competition. The first part of the definition seems to refer to an advantage gained through a doping violation, which by virtue of the doping definition is unfair. Second part of the definition seems to refer to a comparative ranking of advantages. So I'm going to read it again. An advantage that disproportionately exceeds other advantages that exist at high level competition. So in regard to this latter part of the definition, it seems therefore to be a question of relative magnitude of the property advantage provided by testosterone compared to other natural property advantages. Included in the word disproportionately is a comparison, some, a proportion, something that you're going to compare against other advantages. So it seems that there are at least two different meanings of fairness at play here. The meaning of fairness of the word athletics, fairness as a level playing field, which can be disrupted by levels of property advantages, although somewhat inconsistently because only testosterone is being targeted. 
And the meaning of fairness that Semena, Dutichan, or other athletes with high level of testosterone refer to the understanding of the untampered natural body. These two meanings were never made explicit uh, in, the, um, in the court for arbitration of sport. And I think that is an first important uh, 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 ethical and epistemological issue to untackle, to tackle, and to, and to, I think, bring on to future uh, cases because the the case cannot be solved only on the basis of scientific evidence. So now I will put forward definition of fairness in competition based on fair equality of opportunity and attainability of the advantage within a given category, which can be operationalized. And this is based uh, on uh, my work with Finnish scholar Amahineyan Mika. Uh, we work which we published in the European Journal of Sports Science in 2021 when we tried to look at um, the philosophy of sport um, literature and look at the different criteria which have been used to distinguish a fair from an unfair advantage in sport. And then uh, we, can, we came up with uh, a list based on the literature and then tried to apply to the case of uh, Semenya versus Eurom Antirantam. Antiranta, the famous... Uh, uh, Finnish uh, uh, cross-country skier who had a genetic condition uh, which borders um, is the pathological, which is a primary familiar polycythemia, for which basically the receptor for, uh, mm, for erythropoietin is always active uh, if you have these mutations. That means that the switch <laughs> to, for uh, for the production of EPO is always active in people affected by such mutations. So he had levels of hematocrit that um, um, were around, uh, according to the available data, uh, 60. So he had a natural performance advantage. And, um, and that advantage was not considered unfair. So sub the, the view that uh, we put forward that we think can be helpful because it can be operationalized in discussion of uh, unfair advantage that pertain to both athletes with DSD or trans athletes when we are discussing criteria or possible restriction to their eligibility to participate in the female category is a view which is called substantial fairness in sport based on fair equality of opportunity and of attainability of the advantage within the category. So for fair equality of opportunity, we're relying on the work of Norwegian philosopher of sport, Sigmund Loland, who has uh, extensively developed this view of fair equality of opportunity as a core normative pre premise and underlying the classification in sport. Loland, building on a Rolschian approach to fairness, uh, uh, writes that Rolls points to the ideal of fair equality of opportunity, prescribing that individuals with similar endowments and talents and similar ambition should have similar opportunities and roughly equivalent prospect for competitive su success in a given category. And I know that uh, we have, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be chairing the panel on transnational uh, gender regulation later. And I know that also Jonathan Cooper has written about this. So uh, the fair equality opportunity is really a core principle underlying uh, why do we have a classification in sport? Why we have the, the binary system in, uh, in athletics? Or you know, should we still have it? Or should we, should we uh, move on? So in our work with Amahineyan, uh, we define property advantage. We define two types of advantages. One is quite straightforward, the performance advantage, which can be the difference uh, in terms of points at the end of a match or goals scored, or the difference in terms of seconds between uh, two athletes uh, and so on and so forth. That's a performance advantage. The property advantage uh, is uh, actually what we're talking about when we talk about elevated level of a natural biological property. So A, 
has an advantage over B in a certain property X if A has a more favorable amount of this property. This definition, again, does not tell us whether um, a female athletes with level of testosterone above 5 nanomoles per liter or 2.5 nanomoles per liter, according to the Federation, can be considered unfair. But what we need to do from a policy perspective is to have a clear and established criteria on how we can do that in a way that is uh, transparent, hopefully based on evidence, um, and uh, in a way that, uh, from a procedural point of view, is explicit what we are doing. So um, with Amahinean, we have uh, come up, I'm not going to spend too much time about this, but I refer to, to the 2021 paper, 10 different ways in which an advantage can be considered fair or unfair. Uh, some of these uh, are pertain to the distinction between natural and unnatural. That's the kind of understanding of fairness that the athletes, duty Chan and Semenya point towards. Other criteria are criteria that are procedural, such as it's unfair if it is against the rule. So if it is a rule against that, we can consider that kind of uh, advantage to be unfair. It is against the spirit of sport. You know, why is doping unfair? Because it is against the spirit of sport as per the procedural definition of spirit of sport, which could be a discussion for another talk. But for the point of um, unfair advantage, uh, we are gonna focus on it is attainable or not to others in that category. So the question of attainability within the given category is an empirical question. It's an empirical question, but it is necessarily also a comparative question. So we're talking about a, a degree of relative advantage of a given property, advantage, testosterone, elevated level of hematocrit, that uh, contribute to the overall performance advantage. So the key question, which we think can be operationalized uh, when we are discussing uh, criteria or restriction, is the following. Is the performance advantage given by the property advantage of elevated level of testosterone attainable by others in the same category who do not have the same property advantage? Can the performance advantage the Castor Semenya enjoys because of their of her property advantage be attained by other athletes who do not have that property advantage, who do not have elevated levels of testosterone. If a performance advantage can be attained, then we cannot say that their advantage is unfair. Or we, if we want to say that is unfair, then we need to look at the other property advantages that confer a similar degree. As I was mentioning earlier, in, we can capture in the definition of unfair advantage of the IOC framework is the word uh, disproportionate, which implies a proportion, a comparison. So in the paper, we have a section in which we build on, uh, we look at what kind of evidence is available in relation to uh, athletes with DSD to answer the question of, of whether their performance advantage is attainable or not by others. So we know that uh, the Court for Arbitration of Sport already mentioned uh, Alun uh, Williams' testimony, sports scientist at Metropolitan University, uh, expert witness at CAS. He testified that there is no clear qualitative distinction between types of genetic variation that cause differences of sex differentiation and other. Williams compares the performance advantage derived by DSD mutation and the phenotypic effect of the alpha actin 3 allele, which is considered an acceptable performance advantage in sprinting and power event. Williams testified that athletes who possess the alpha actin 3 allele are likely to sweep the podium in power and sprinting event. And he added that the only difference between testosterone and other biological genetic variation is that presently it is not known which athletes have which genetic uh, advantages, genetic variation. But in the future, we can imagine that we will know. I mean, the sports genomics um, 
every day is discovering new alleles and in the future, and I also work on biotechnology of reproduction, we're gonna have a whole genome sequence in our athletes uh, when they're born, and then we're just gonna say, okay, what kind, what kind of sport should this person play, uh, do? Should we put this person into sprinting or into power? And this is just, you know, we have the technology, it's cheap, and uh, it is very plausible that it's going to happen. The next step is to engineer uh, embryos with CRISPR gen genetic technologies and create athletes that are genetically modified. Also, again, this is, again, not science fiction, but it is a technology which is uh, uh, already being used at embryonic level to cure like sickle cell anemia or other types of uh, uh, condition which are considered severe. And we also know, we know that the technology you know, starts out to be used for something that you consider a medical necessity and then can be used for other. So this was a bit of a detour, but I think the point that Alan Williams made is a very important point. The only difference is that it's not known at the present time which elite athletes have which advantages genetic variation. The court decided that they were only going to arbitrate in relation to the level of testosterone and the evidence that was submitted. They didn't want to, they said that this kind of um, testimony was not relevant for their final arbitration. Uh, in the paper, I also bring in uh, the work of my co author, Jonathan Ospina Betancourt, uh, who is a statistician and mathematician. He now works uh, at the University of uh, Madrid, in which um, Jonathan Spina Betancourt, in two papers, one published in 2018 and one in 2020, analyzed uh, the, the results of Castor Semenya uh, in, in the analyzed all the results of Castor Semenya and uh, uh, looked at. Uh, mm, looked at whether a results fall outside uh, the 99% confidence that the characteristic curve designed for the 800 meters of female runner would have posited. Now, since this is not exactly my <laughs> expertise, um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit and then uh, you can read the paper, okay? So, but basically, uh, Jonathan, um, what they did is that uh, on the basis of all the results of 800 meter runners, they built this curve and they looked at whether the actual performance of Semenya was falling outside the characteristic 90% level of confidence. And they said that um, uh, although for the best performances, uh, for her best performance, it, it did fall outside the 19 nine percent level of confidence semenya is not alone because they also looked at other sprinters such as usain bolt uh, they also looked at other 800 meter runners such as uh, pamela jellimon the kenyan who won the in the, um, the gold medal at the olympics uh, in beijing in 2008 and actually in the case of pamela jellimon the 800 meter run runner uh, her actual performance fell outside this 99% confidence curve of prediction uh, by a greater degree than Castor Semenya. So mm, there are some data. Basically, the predictive finishing time uh, was uh, larger for Jalimo than for Semenya. The point is that why are we, we are focusing on Semenya? But this, the data by Jonathan Ospina, Betancourt, and the co-authors, the data by Alan Williams, also uh, at, at CAS, there was another expert witness, uh, uh, Ross um, Tucker. They all point in the direction that her performance advantage is attainable by other in the female category who do not have elevated level of testosterone. She's not unbeatable. She can be beaten by others who do not have her same genetic condition. That means that, uh, yes, she's lucky in that regard. I mean, when I was working with Mika, who is Finnish, uh, so we were looking at Mantiranta and he was reading uh, uh, you know, literature in Finnish, he said, of course, Mantiranta was lucky to have that genetic condition. He was lucky while he was competing because later in life, the, it was that condition is pathological. You know, of course, what is normal and what is pathological depends on, in the, on the contest. This is Kangiyam. But if you are doing cross-country event, uh, that uh, high level of hematocrit are an advantage for you. If you're not, 
maybe you can you need to take uh, drugs to regulate that because you can have a higher incidence of strokes okay so anyhow uh, mantiranta was lucky to have the kind of genetic natural advantage but that was that didn't mean that it was the best cross country skier ever it was beatable by others who didn't have the genetic advantage because we know that the performance uh, excellence in performance is due to a combination of factors of which genetics plays a big part but thanks doesn't it's not the end of the story okay so uh in the paper we're gonna explain better our point about category of uh, attainability with more data and say that we don't think that um, Castor Semenya, Duty Chand, and DSD advantage can be considered unfair, hence. But there is a, a bigger problem with the evidence. And this is, uh, when is evidence considered enough evidence in the context of sport? And this is an epistemological and ethical problem. I think I've heard a lot uh, these two days about the special uh, autonomy, which is given to the sports context. And I learned a bit more about the language which is used, such as you know, a conditional autonomy, special status. But I'm going to tell you my take as an external when I was reading some things about the, the level of evidence and what was considered enough. And I think uh, it's both an ethical and epistemological problem. We all know that the evidence which has been put forward by World Athletics, the British Journal of Sports Medicine article with Bermond as first author had lots of problems. It looked like first oh, it was produced uh, by uh, the IWF at that time, now World Athletics Medical Director, Stefan Bermon, uh, as has been pointed out by expert witness at SCAS, Roger Pilkey, who I'm gonna mention again in the last part of my talk, no other regulatory context exists where the evidence base for the regulation is provided by the regulatory body itself. We would consider that no go in all the other contexts. But again, I understand that that's might be warranted from historical perspective. But the point is that the, the, the data themselves are not being replicated. So independent teams uh, of scholars, Songsen, Peter Songsen, and my team with Jonathan Ospina Betancourt and Simon Franklin, uh, there's a statistician, I'm the one who wrote about fairness. They tried to replicate the data and uh, they were unable to do so. That means that uh, even uh, the data for the advantage in the restricted event from the 400 meter to the miles uh, was uh, our conclusion uh, cherry picked. So there was a high probability of false positive. Now, what did the Court for Arbitration of Sport? Uh, then there are ethical problems that I know will be discussed in the panel by Marcus uh, uh, um, here. And I had just briefly mentioned them in my 2019 paper, but only from the point of view of ethics, not of law, but uh, pointing out that athletes had provided their blood samples had not consented by any means to the use of their blood samples for anything beyond doping testing. And this was at the center of the Athletic South Africa Challenge. So there was, you know, we, we all know there was this double challenge, Caster Semenya and a lawyer focusing on human rights angle and discrimination. Athletic South Africa and their lawyers were focusing on admissibility of evidence. They, if I read it correctly, they were saying this evidence should not be admissible because it also has these problems. So it hasn't been replicated, the problem of conflict of interest, it doesn't meet the criteria of admissibility of evidence in the courtroom, which were pointed out by Roger Pilke. And by the way, there are all these issues with they were um, uh, sampled, they were collected for something else. But, and, and then Marcus is gonna talk more about this in the panel. Anyhow, what did Cass respond? Cass responded that on page uh, 76 and 77 of the word, that the sports bet that Cass responded. No, uh, page, sorry, on page 76 and 77 of the Cass arbitral award, the IWF, now World Athletics states that sport benefit from a significant margin of appreciation in determining what is necessary and proportionate to achieve 
the legitimate objectives. So this is IWF self pleading for autonomy. Accordingly, IWF must decide what is necessary and proportionate to achieve its aims on the basis of an honest, good faith that has a reasonable basis. As long as that test is met, honest, good faith, reasonable basis, it is irrelevant that others might disagree with that view or may cite others' contrary scientific evidence. It's irrelevant. Rather, in order to succeed in their challenge, the claimants, so the burden of proof is on the athletes, and again, the burden of proof, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Marjolaine Vire. The, rather, in order to succeed in their challenge, the claimants must establish that a reasonable person acting in good faith could not hold the view that DSD regulations are necessary and appropriate to achieve the legitimate objective. So why, why do we need uh, peer-reviewed evidence published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine? We just ask the first person that, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I had this summer conversation with my you know, family members. What, what do you think about uh, DSD regulation? Do you think uh, they're you know, in good faith, the honest assessment? Do you think they're reasonable? You know, if you have lots of level of tests and look at Semenya. Maybe, you know, she has an advantage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that, that's my take from the outside. I think, and I wrote about that, I thought that this level of evidence being so low is appalling. And of course, it should be relevant if others disagree in the scientific community. Also, I find it problematic, but I look forward to hearing more about the fact that arbitrators could uh, decide on this issue not unanimously, you know, it was a 2.1 decision, but understand that that's the norm. I still think it's problematic for that they can decide just with a majority, which is a majority of two to one. But I look, again, I, I don't know. So I look forward to hearing more later. But in a, if we look at the evidence requested by the IOC framework for inclusion, we, I, there is something contradictory to CAS in a good way because the IOC framework on fairness and inclusion emphasizes the central role of evidence. In fact, they write that um, any section six of the framework, the framework is very clear in that regard and states that any restriction arising from eligibility criteria should be based on robust and peer reviewed evidence. So there seems to be a prima facie tension between the IOC framework and the request for robust evidence and the CAS decision, uh, which bought into the IWF uh, uh, you know, statement that uh, uh, we only needed a lower bar of evidence that of a reasonable person in good faith. So a key question is uh, how high or how low the bar for supporting evidence for policy will be going forward. Uh, and if there is another uh, appeal brought forward by athletes to CAS, what will CAS decide? I think this is an epistemological and ethical problem about the level of evidence. Now, moving towards the last part. The last part would be, we can agree, I think from what I've said, we can agree that uh, it is difficult to resolve the case of athletes with DSD or athletes, trans athletes on the basis of fairness only. There is a problem, which is that there are different understanding of fairness at place that have not been made explicit, but there are also other values that are relevant. Um, other values that are relevant when we talk about um, uh, a construction of categories in sport and possible criteria to restrict participation. So the strategy which I would like to put forward is a, called the, a clumsy pragmatic approach to policy making, building on the work done by Roger Pilkey. Clumsy because it looks at optimizing around the multiplicity of value. This is the definition of clumsy in policy making, and pragmatic because it's revisable, revisable and subject to evidence. The compass of value would need to include, of course, inclusivity. Although we hear about inclusivity everywhere, but often it's more of like a facade words, yeah, like a gender neutral restroom, so that we are inclusive. But what does inclusivity mean when we know that it's only 
a value which is not absolute and there are competing values at play. So when there are values that are in conflict, a certain un understanding of fairness provided that hopefully I think we should first agree on what we mean by fairness. And then uh, we should say, okay, but fairness could be in conflict with inclusivity. And uh, we know, and here I'm quoting some of the um, the approach which looks at the compass of value in public uh, policy is an approach which we've seen at play in many other contexts. So I think it's uh, important to look at approaches that have worked in other contexts when producing policy making and trying to spell out the underlying relevant normative value. So for example, in the context of public health policies, Michael Salgalid identified three values that need to be pursued and balanced from policymakers, liberty, equality, and utility. In the context of the recent pandemic, we have seen that different countries, based on the same levels of uh, evidence that was available at a given time, have uh, come up with very different public health policy. So in some of my work, which I've done with um, uh, colleagues at the University of York, we have compared the public health policy in the UK and in Italy and say, well, we had the same level of scientific evidence which was coming in and was being published um, uh, ahead of print on uh, SARS-CoV-2. But in Italy, we had the restriction that privileged uh, um, uh, we had higher level of restriction on movement, for example, uh, running or walking for leisure was prohibited in, in Italy during lockdown, that was not the case in the UK. And also the use of face mask uh, continued to be compulsory until May of 2022, outdoor May of 2022 in Italy, okay? So the same level of evidence, different policies. So there were a lot of disagreements, if you remember, about all oh, different policymakers. And they were all saying, we're following the science. We're following the science. And in policymaking, there's a lot of this expert-led policy. But actually, the answers to how to manage uh, a crisis, uh, a pandemic, or how to decide about restriction for eligibility of uh, female athletes, uh, cannot be answered just by following the science, because these are questions that pertain to value, pertain to value of fairness, inclusivity. And in our paper, we also spend some time talking about the value of uh, competitiveness in a given category. Basically, we argue that within a given category, competitiveness needs to be retained. And that is linked to the point of the attainability of the advantage. You know, the advantage needs not to be so great that the particular athletes can never uh, be beaten. Although, you know, we, we know that there are outliers in the context of sport over given a uh, number of years, there are those athletes such as Usain Ball, Simon Biles, or Alex Duplantis that uh, are outliers that are impossible to beat. Competitive needs to be retained to a certain extent given uh, within a given category. Now, where does this take us? Different stakeholders can assign different weight to different uh, values. This is just what happens in policy making. The example of the pandemic, I think, illustrates that very clearly, and we can all like it can resonate because we can relate to. Depending on which country we came from, we had different policy in place to tackle uh, like the same problem, and the issue was often framed as a scientific a health problem issue, but it wasn't. It is an issue that involves value. So whenever we're talking about value. We need to be uh, first agree on definition. If it's impossible to agree on definition because there are competing understanding of fairness, we should at least be transparent and say, okay, we can't agree because there are different definitions, but at least this is what is that we are disagreeing about. That it should be the first step. So the second step should be acknowledging that we can assign different ways in different contexts. Some of this weight might be sport specific. In a given sport, uh, we might privilege uh, 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 fairness understood as fair equality of opportunity because we know that the advantage provided by testosterone 
we know based on evidence, hopefully gives uh, a greater relative um, degree of advantage than in other sport. We can also look uh, at some authors uh, who have uh, recently published a paper this summer in the Hastings Center report for bioathlete, look at the context of youth sport um, where we might want to privilege inclusivity, give a higher weight to inclusivity. And then, of course, it's different to set threshold, but the point should be that, uh, you know, it's concept specific and the weight assigned to value will be uh, part of a balancing act, uh, an exercise in reflective equilibrium that hopefully should happen at the level of policy making. Of course, I understand that um, uh, this is an, is, I mean, I'm not here to offer like the solution to the problem of uh, um, criteria or possible restriction regarding trans athletes in a given uh, sport. But I think that uh, the way in which we should talk about this issue uh, should have this general approach. So spell out the underlying values, agree on, on definition. If it's not possible to agree, at least be clear on what people are disagreeing about. Look at the compass of value, in the paper, we talk about inclusivity, fairness, and competitiveness. There might be other values that people think are important depending on the sport, the safety, um, or other value that could be sport specific. And then we try to do a reflective equilibrium exercise in balancing these values in a given context to come up with justifiable criteria. And he here, the final point is a point about justifiability and procedural fairness. So from my perspective uh, as an ethicist, you know, there are two levels of fairness, a substantial fairness, which is a kind of discussion of what is fairness in sport, the meaning of sport, the kind of philosophy, uh, conceptual understanding of substantial fairness. And then there is a procedural fairness, making sure that the process is fair. The process by which decisions are reached should be transparent, uh, not behind closed doors, hopefully. And I know that you know, athletes uh, and their lawyers have requested that the hearings are not behind closed doors, but Cass has repeatedly said, no, 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 no. Uh, also caving in into the Federation request. Based on peer reviewed evidence, no uh, honest person in good faith. Uh, it should be a level of peer review and it should be relevant if others disagree. Of course, there can be expert disagreement, but uh, it should be assessed uh, to whether it is really an expert disagreement or you know, what is that uh, the different publication are pointed to. The data are not replicable. The data, underlying data, raw data should be shared which wasn't the case for the DSD regulation, only partially. So availability of data, the problem of consent of the data, so in which ways uh, it's also very special about the context of sports, the athletes consent to have the blood sample for doping, and then it's a blank consent. So in ethics, a blank consent doesn't really work, can't, it can't be justifiable, even if it is, it is practice. I cannot give my blank consent. You remember the case of Henrietta Lacks, giving Henrietta Lacks, this Afro-American woman dying in, uh, in her 30s uh, due to ovarian cancer and her cells uh, were taken without consent, used all over the world, uh, made a lot of money on patents, the famous, the famous HeLa cells. Uh, whoever has worked in a lab, there is a book and a movie about the HeLa cell. That was obvious breach of consent. So when you ask, I'm taking your cells for, for something, then if I want to use it for something else, I should go back and ask you, okay? So, so I don't think blank consent can be justified from an ethical point of view. Making explicit the values underlying the policy, it's not just about following the science, we're talking about values and what kind of evidence counts in court. I remember in the 2015 Duty Chand case, one of, at the time I'd written a paper with Carcassis published in the American Journal of Bioethics 2012. And Carcassis was one of the expert witness. She's a, we were based at Stanford at the time. And Cass has one sentence saying, sociological opinion does not have the same status as scientific evidence. Sociological opinion was our paper. Okay, <laughs> one sentence. <laughs> So hopefully from 2015 to now, things have moved on and we are more aware that um, 
uh, there are other type of evidence that should count. I'm not sure, but. And finally, um, last facade word, I mean, discrimination, I mean, the IOC inclusion framework talks about, oh, no, discrimination, absolutely not, inclusivity, but we know that discrimination can be justified, and, and it was. It's not that discrimination can never be justified. Discrimination on the basis of uh, evidence was justified in this uh, duty chan case. Initially, it wasn't. The regulation were suspended because the arbitrator decided that the female category was being discriminated, but then additional evidence uh, was uh, uh, given. And anyhow, the arbitrator decided that it was a suspension only until additional evidence was going to be produced and submitted. So they agreed on the general point that there could be pharmacological regulation that required pharmacological suppression and in this way discriminated the female categories because we don't do the same with the male category, but discrimination can be justified. So talk of there should never be discrimination is just empty talk. And the same with talk of inclusivity, which actually doesn't uh, clearly state, well, inclusivity is not a, a win now. Uh, uh, at all costs value, inclusivity can be in conflict with other value. And sometimes we are not just are not going to be as inclusive as um, we could be because X, Y, and that. Okay. So in the end, I almost 1 p.m. Thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to your questions.